Um, so this is intended to be a student tutorial. Uh, so I've uploaded my, sli my slides to the Cedar Wiki. You can find them on the link there. Uh, I strongly encourage all the students in the audience to download those slides and to go back afterwards and work your way through a lot of the math I'm going to show. Working your way through a lot of these derivations will really teach you a lot about plasma physics and about how the languages used by all of our different communities are interrelated to each other. So on the Cedar Wiki is the link right there. Is that better? Good. So I was once asked by a physics professor who was not a plasma physicist how geospace electrodynamics can be a field of research, right? We all study Maxwell's equations. We all take Jackson E and M. How is any of this still unsolved? And that attitude is missing something very important about Maxwell's equations. They completely describe the evolution of electric and magnetic fields, but they're not a closed system of equations. There's no way to solve these equations without some specification of the charges and currents involved. And so in free space, where the charges and currents are simply zero, it's a closed set of equations that's totally linear. How to solve it is a totally known problem. If the charging and currents are specified for you a priori, how to solve this is also a known problem. But in general media like space plasmas, the currents flowing in that medium are related to the fields through all the complicated particle motion. And so in order to come up with a closed system of equations, you have to couple Maxwell's equations to some kind of generalized Ohm's law that tells you how the currents are related to the fields. And that will produce a coupled system of equations that is in general non-trivial. So for space plasmas, the rigorous thing to do is to write down a fully kinetic description of the entire coupled system. So I've written out here the Vlasov equations in terms of the particle distribution functions. These particle distribution functions, they're, they're a function of seven independent variables, three spatial coordinates, three velocity coordinates, and time. And if you take these kinetic equations, solve them for the particle distributions, take the first velocity moments of those particle distributions and subtract them to get the current and substitute that back into Maxwell's equations, that's a closed system. And it's a, a coupled system in both directions because the particle distribution functions influence the currents in Maxwell's equations and then the fields in Maxwell's equations control the particle motion. Now, even though this is a complete theory, in most cases it is impractical to use. Right? In, in, in the, there's not a whole lot of intuition you can gain by staring at these equations. In, in most instances, they are impractical to solve numerically. And so in our field, we spend a lot of time constructing various different approximate theories of electrodynamics. And there's not just one approximate theory, there's a whole family of them, right? And all those different theories are all interrelated to each other by dropping various terms from the more complete theories. So a common approximation is to throw away the displacement current term in the Ampere-Maxwell law, the DEDT. That term is normally only thought to be important for radio waves, light waves, and very high frequency phenomena. Another approximation is dropping away the DBDT term in Faraday's law, the inductive electric fields. This leads to the so-called electrostatic approximation that is very commonly used in the ionosphere, but not very commonly used in the magnetosphere. And then lastly, but perhaps most importantly, are simplifications that you can make to the particle motion equations. So instead of solving the full Vlasov equations, there are lots of various approximate theories for the particle motion that you can develop, say using fluid theories instead of kinetic theory, making approximations to the particle motions like guiding center approximations or adiabatic assumptions that simplify the equations that you're working with. So if you look around the field, there are lots of different combinations of these assumptions that you can put together and come up with lots of different approximate theories of electrodynamics. And, and sometimes it can be, be very difficult to understand other people working in a different segment of the geospace community who are used to using a different limit and a different set of approximations and an entirely different language from what you may be used to. So today I'm gonna to go through some of the basic major approximate theories that are used around the field. I'm gonna start with the discussion of ionospheric electrostatics. 
I'm then going to move on and talk about the inner magnetosphere. Um, and then I'm going to move outwards and talk about magnetohydrodynamics, which is one of the most commonly used theories to describe the solar wind and outer magnetosphere. I'm going to talk about solar wind magnetosphere ionosphere coupling. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite regions of geospace, which is the polar wind and auroral acceleration region. So my goal here today is to talk to all the students who may be uh, involved in just one of these areas and talk to them about how the limit that they are used to using is related to the limits that all the other folks use so that we can all have a productive Cedar Gem meeting and actually understand how to talk to each other. So let me start with electrostatics. The way you get to the electrostatic approximation is by throwing away all the time derivative terms in Maxwell's equations. So if you throw away the displacement current term and then take the divergence of both sides of this equation, recalling that the divergence of the curl of any vector is always zero, that gets you to divergence of j equals zero. I could have equivalently gotten there from just going back to the law of conservation of charge and throwing away the time derivative of the charge density. So currents have to flow in closed loops. Now the electrostatic condition actually comes from throwing away the time derivative of the magnetic field. So if curl of E equals zero, then the electric field can be written as the negative gradient of a scalar potential, because the curl of the gradient of any fun scalar function is zero. Now to complete the set of equations, you need some kind of Ohm's law describing how the currents in the ionosphere are related to the electric fields. And in general, you can write this as the currents are some conductivity tensor dotted into the electric field plus a whole bunch of other currents that are driven by things other than electric fields. If you take this expression, plug it into divergence of j equals zero, and replace the electric field with the negative gradient of a scalar potential, you get an elliptic partial differential equation that is a boundary value problem for those scalar potentials. So in order to fill out that boundary value problem, I need to talk about how we derive Ohm's law for the ionosphere. So the starting point, the easy starting point, is just motion of particles in uniform fields, right? Just the Lorentz force equation. So if I have a magnetic field that's pointed out of the board, um, electrons and ions will gyrate around in circles such that if you point your thumb along the magnetic field, the electrons are right-handed and the ions are left-handed. If you add a constant electric field to this picture, well, when an ion is moving parallel to the electric field, it will be accelerated and go in a wider radius, and then when it's going the opposite direction, it will be decelerated, do a smaller radius, and so it won't come back to the same position, it'll drift sideways. And the electrons will do the same thing, and they will drift, they rotate in the opposite sense, but they will drift in the same direction. And so in a constant electric and magnetic field, the electrons and the ions drift together at a velocity of E cross B over B squared, uh, which is known as the E cross B drift. The, the frame moving with the E cross B drift is a very special frame, because if you actually plug that velocity into the Lorentz force equation, the electric field plus E cross B over B squared cross B is zero as long as there's no parallel electric fields. So the frame moving with the E cross B drift is the frame in which the particles experience no net force from the Lorentz force. So to work in the ionosphere, I have to add collisions to that picture because the ionosphere is actually a very small part of the upper atmosphere that is embedded in the much more massive and much denser thermosphere which which all the ions and electrons are constantly colliding. So in a collisionless plasma, the electrons and the ions drift together and there's no net current. But if there are collisions and if the collision frequency is comparable to the gyro frequencies, then that drift motion will be interrupted periodically causing the ions to go off at some angle and the electrons to also go off at a different angle. So if the ions are going this way and the electrons are going that way, there's a net current flowing in the vertical direction parallel to the electric field. So mathematically, if you write down a steady state momentum equation for each of the plasma species, including the Lorentz force and drag on the neutrals, if you then solve this for the velocity and sum over the densities times charges times the velocities to get the current density, you get an expression for the electric field in 
for the current in terms of the electric field that is related through a conductivity tensor. And I've written in here in the coordinate system where the magnet, the parallel to the magnetic field direction is the third coordinate. So there is a conductivity in the parallel direction that is extremely large, and for all intents and purposes in the ionosphere, normally considered to just be infinity. Along the diagonal is the so-called Pedersen conductivity. So the case where the ions go like this and the electrons go like that, and there's a net current upwards, that's a current that is parallel to the direction of E. That's what we call a Pedersen current. Now, it's not always the case that the electron collisionality and the ion collisionality matches. Sometimes you have the ions being very collisional and executing something like this, but the electrons still being essentially collisionless and E cross B drifting. And so in that case, there's a Pedersen current, but there's also carried, there's also a current carried by the electrons E cross B drifting without the ions E cross B drifting with them. And that current flows in the negative E cross B direction it's carried primarily by the electrons, and that's what we call a Hall current. And that's why there are these off-diagonal terms in the conductivity tensor. So in the ionosphere, uh, the Pedersen conductivities increase as you go downwards. They're normally larger than the Hall conductivities. But when you get down to the E region, there's a point where the Hall con conductivities actually exceed the Pedersen conductivities. So that was just talking about electric fields, but there are other forces acting on the ionospheric plasma that drive other types of current. So if you go back to my steady state momentum equation and replace QE with some other force, you can derive currents driven by any other force you want. So if there's a neutral wind, that neutral wind uh, exhibits a drag on the plasma and you can derive a current associated with that. And that current is actually, J is the same conductivity tensor dotted into the UN cross B. Gravity can drive current. So gravity has a negligible effect on the electrons, but it does influence the ions. Uh, and so in a collisionless plasma, gravity will cause ions to drift in the G cross B direction. If there are some collisions, then the ions will be interrupted and they'll go off at some angle. So in general, the currents driven by gravity are related to the gravitational field through another tensor. Uh, and then lastly, there are pressure gradients that lead to the so-called diamagnetic currents. So if you take all these different types of currents and put them together into what I was calling J naught before and substitute that into your dynamo equation, you get a complete equation for the electrostatic field. So this equation, if you know the neutral winds, you know gravity, you know all the pressure gradients, um, you know the conductivity tensor that goes in both these locations, you can solve a boundary value problem for the electrostatic potential. This is what we call the ionospheric dynamo equation because it describes the way neutral winds end up driving electric fields. So in general, the dynamo equation is something that is solved numerically uh, on computers. Um, but there are certain simple cases where you can get some intuition for how it works. So Mike Kelly likes to use these slab models because you can solve them quite easily. Um, when discussing these slab models, I'm going to have to be extremely careful um, to use the subjunctive verb case because the dynamo equation describes what the equilibrium state will be, but it does not describe the way that the, that the system evolves towards that state. So for example, in the F region, suppose that I had a slab of high Pen Pedersen conductivity with negligible Pedersen conductivity outside of it. And suppose that there was a neutral wind. If that neutral wind existed without an electric field, there would be a vertical current driven by it that would be non-divergent. Therefore, the equilibrium solution must include an, a non-zero electric field, and that electric field must be such that it opposes that vertical current, getting you a net current of zero. So that electric field has to be the negative of UN cross B. And if you plug that electric field into the E cross B drift equation, do some simplifications, you see that the plasma velocity is simply equal to the neutral velocity in that case. So there is an electric field that forms such that the plasmas and the neutrals move together. The E region is more complicated to understand because there's both a Pedersen and a Hall conductivity. So suppose I had a slab of high con conductivity for both Pedersen and Hall, and there was an eastward directed electric field. If that field existed by itself, there would be a current flowing down the slab but there would also be a vertical Hall current that would be non-divergent. 
non-divergent, that would be divergent, that would have a non-zero divergence. And so the equilibrium solution must also include an additional vertical electric field such that the Pedersen current driven by that vertical electric field cancels the Hall current driven by the horizontal electric field. Now, if there's a vertical electric field driving a Pedersen current, it also drives a Hall current down the channel. So the, the total current flowing in the X direction is not just the Pedersen current driven by that EX, but it's also um, the Hall current associated with this uh, vertical polarization field. And if you sum those two together, you get that the current down the channel is the eastward electric field times a conductivity that's much larger than either the Pedersen or Hall conductivity individually, which ionospheric scientists typically call the cowling conductivity. So up until now, I've been talking about currents flowing just internally inside the ionosphere, but there are also situations where currents flow from the magnetosphere down into the ionosphere. And we can include those in the dynamo equation by just adding the additional condition just adding the divergence of those currents to the other side of the dynamo equation. Now, from the magnetospheric scientist's point of view, the ionosphere is normally treated as a thin slab. So this equation is normally simplified by integrating over the field line direction. So if I take a vertical integral of both sides of this equation, I'm gonna replace the conductivities with a conductance tensor, which is just the vertical integral of those same conductivities. I'm going to assume that the potential is, that the field line is an equal potential. Um, and I'm going to simplify this vertical integral of the divergence of the magnetospheric currents by expanding the divergence and then noting if I integrate both sides and the magnetospheric perpendicular currents go to zero above the ionosphere, I get that this integral is just the parallel current entering from the magnetosphere. And so you can write down a 2D slab ionosphere equation that relates the ionospheric potential to these height integrated conductances, the divergence of the sheet currents flowing in the ionosphere, and the currents, the parallel currents flowing in from the magnetosphere. Now you can also use this 2D slab thing to describe the low latitude ionosphere as well. Um, if you want to take a field line integral of the low latitude ionosphere, you have to acknowledge that you're on a closed field line and therefore, the parallel current flowing out of the northern hemisphere equals the parallel current flowing into the southern hemisphere. And so if you take that slab equation for the northern hemisphere and equate it to the negative, what is equal to the southern hemisphere, and rearrange, you get what looks like a single dynamo equation for both hemispheres, involving the wind-driven currents from both hemispheres and the conductances from both hemispheres. And in doing this, I had to assume that the entire field line was an equal potential. And there's lots of experimental evidence that that, what we call field line mapping, is correct for large scale electric fields on slow time scales. So the data I'm showing here, it's optical data of mesoscale traveling ionospheric disturbances that was collected both in Japan and in Australia. And if you take the images from Australia, flip them backwards and put them next to the images from Japan, these structures line up one to one. It's because they're driven by the same electric fields that are mapping along the field lines in both directions. So if you go ahead and solve the dynamo equation with, with um, typical tidal driven currents, um, and then take the eastward electric fields of the equator and turn them into a vertical E cross B drift, the typical pattern at the equator is such that the vertical drifts are downwards at night and upwards during the day. And that pattern combined with diffusion along the field lines leads to the so-called equatorial fountain effect, where the plasma will be lifted, it'll slide down the field lines and build up in regions on either side of the equator. These regions of buildup on either side of the equator are what are referred to as the Appleton anomalies. And how big they are, where, where exactly they form, depends on the strength of these vertical electric fields. And so studying the morphology of the Appleton anomalies actually tells us a lot about the electric fields in the low latitudes. So here is an optical image from the image satellite. It's showing uh, UV emissions that are related to the recombination rate. They're essentially related to the density. You can see the anomalies here extremely clearly. But if you look closely, you also notice that there are, there's a four-peak structure in this plot. There are certain longitudes that have stronger electric fields than others. 
this is thought to be the influence of non-migrating tides. So the electric fields in the ionosphere are driven by all the different spectrum of neutral wind coming up. If you have uh, non-migrating tides that have a particular longitude dependence, they will impart that longitude dependence onto the electric fields and thus onto the anomalies themselves. And much more in-depth study of the way that the lower atmosphere and the upper atmosphere interact through the dynamo equation is one of the, the central uh, objectives of the ICON and GOLD missions that are coming up next year. So now I'm going to move on and move further out in space into the inner magnetosphere. And as we go from the ionosphere out into the inner magnetosphere, I have to start acknowledging that magnetic field lines are not constant. The magnetic fields, um, they have uh, gradients in their strength, they have curvature, uh, and so I have to go back to the particle equations and expand my library of different types of drift to deal with non-uniform magnetic fields. And the first thing to talk about is the magnetic mirror force. So if I have a region, if I'm transitioning from a region of low magnetic field strength to strong magnetic field strength, then to maintain divergence of B equals zero, the field lines need to be curved going into that. Well, if the field lines are curved, then as a particle is gyrating around, the V cross B Lorentz force isn't pointing exactly towards the center of the circle. So if I have um, an ion that is coming out of the board over here and into the board over there, on this side of the orbit, V cross B points inwards but slightly upwards, and on that side of the orbit, it also points inwards but slightly upwards. So if I average the Lorentz force over a particle gyration motion, it doesn't average to zero. There's a net vertical force that is related to the perpendicular velocity of the particle and the gradient in the magnetic field. That's what we call the magnetic mirror force because it tends to bounce particles away from regions of strong magnetic field strength and keep them trapped in regions of low magnetic field strength. So if I have a particle that's out in the inner magnetosphere, as it comes in towards the pole, the magnetic field lines are much closer together, the magnetic field is much stronger here, the mirror force bounces it back out, and it will bounce back and forth and remain trapped in the inner magnetosphere. The only way for it to get out is if its velocity vector is so close to parallel to the magnetic field that the mirror, the mirror force essentially goes to zero. So the mirror force is related to the perpendicular velocity. If I'm exactly parallel to the magnetic field, there is no mirror force there is a small cone of angles around the direction exactly parallel to the magnetic field that we call the loss cone. That is the only cone of angles where the particles can actually get into the ionosphere from the inner magnetosphere. So there's more than just the mirror force. In the inner magnetosphere, a uh, series of drifts called the gradient and curvature drifts also become important. So if you're looking down at the equatorial plane, the fields are very strong close to the Earth and they're weaker away. So if I have a particle that's out here in the inner magnetosphere, during the part of its orbit where it's further away from the planet, it experiences weaker magnetic field. It moves in a larger circle. As it goes inwards, it experiences stronger magnetic field that goes in a tighter circle. And so it doesn't come back to the same position. It ends up drifting. And the drift is such that the ions, if you're looking down from the North Pole, the ions will drift around the planet clockwise, and the electrons will drift around the planet counterclockwise. Now also, as the particles are bouncing back and forth along the field lines, the field lines are curved. And so if I have a particle moving parallel to the magnetic, with some parallel velocity to the magnetic field, that's being forced to follow a curved field line, well, its own inertia says that it wants to keep traveling in a straight line. So there's a centrifugal force on that particle, and there's a drift associated with that centrifugal force as well. If you look at both of these drifts, the gradient drift is proportional to mv perp squared, the curvature drift is proportional to mv parallel squared. Both of these are energy-dependent drifts. And this is one of the things that makes the inner magnetosphere extremely different from the ionosphere, per, per se. This is why a kinetic theory is used so extensively in the uh, inner magnetosphere, because particles at different energies will do different things. Um, the sense of these drifts 
um, the sense of the curvature drift is also such that the ions will go clockwise and the electrons will go counterclockwise. So these two drifts are normally just combined into one thing and referred to together as the gradient curvature drift. So the particles in the inner magnetosphere are executing a number of different types of periodic motion. And there is a quantity called an adiabatic invariance associated with each one of those different types of periodic motion that is approximately conserved as long as the fields that that particle is propagating in are changing slowly compared to the period of that type of periodic motion. So the fastest type of motion is the gyro motion, the motion around the magnetic field. And associated with that is the so-called first adiabatic invariant. The next is the bounce motion back and forth in the magnetic mirror traps. Uh, and that has a second adiabatic invariant associated with it. Uh, and the third is the drift motion. So as the particles gradient curvature drift around the planet, they will come back to the same position they started in. And the magnetic flux enclosed in any one of those drift shells will be conserved. So the fact that there are these approximate, um, approximately conserved uh, moments, essentially, these, um, there are ways to rewrite the kinetic equations and throw away some of the dimensions in the problem. So when I wrote down the Vlasov equations before, they were six dimensions plus time that I needed to be solving for, three velocity, uh, three position, and time. Um, and that's a very large space to try to work in. If you change your coordinates, however, there are convenient ways to drop some dimensions from the problem. So suppose instead of using Vx, Vy, Vz for the velocity, I talked about the particle energy, the first adiabatic invariant, or something equivalent to it, like the pitch angle the particle will have when it crosses the equatorial plane, and the gyro phase, that is the phase in the gyro motion around. In that coordinate system, if I average over the gyro motion, I can drop this coordinate and just assume all the distribution functions are uniform in the gyro phase. And then I've removed a dimension from the problem. If I go to the spatial coordinates, convenient spatial coordinates are L shell, that is the distance away from the planet the particle is when it crosses the uh, equatorial plane, uh, the position along the field line, and uh, magnetic local time, or some other equivalent coordinate around the planet. Now if I average over the bounce motion, I can drop the position along the field line. And if I average over the drift motion, I can drop that azimuthal coordinate. And so averaging over these three types of motion drops me from six independent variables down to three, which is much more manageable. And if you don't believe that you can average over the drift motion, you just throw away this one, you still only have four. Um, so the way that kinetic theory is presented in the inner magnetosphere is typically doing stuff like this, and thus they're working in coordinate systems that often feel alien to people who are not familiar with intermagnetospheric science, but there's a very good reason for doing it. So the adiabatic invariants are not perfectly conserved. I told you that they're only conserved if the fields are changing slowly compared to the, the underlying type of periodic motion. Well, that's not always the case because there are waves all over the intermagnetosphere. There are lots of different types of waves that occur preferentially in different types of regions. Now this doesn't completely ruin the practice of dropping some dimensions from the problem because you can take the aggregate effect of all of these waves and model them as phase space diffusion. So instead of saying that a particle's adiabatic invariant, say its first adiabatic invariant is perfectly conserved, you could say, okay, this particle is going to execute a random walk in pitch angle and thus slowly diffuse around pitch angle space due to the average effect of all of the waves. And so there's a lot of effort in the inner magnetosphere to come up with drift average and bounce average, so-called diffusion coefficients, which are essentially a way to model the macroscopic implications of all of these tiny waves all over the inner magnetosphere. Now I've talked a lot about single particle motion, but the inner magnetosphere is a plasma that exhibits collective behavior. All these gradient curvature drifts going on that are causing the ions to go one way and the electrons to go the other way are associated with a current that is flowing clockwise around the planet. And that current is associated with a magnetic field through Ampere's law. And those magnetic fields then go on to change the magnetic fields that the particles are gradient curvature drifting in. 
And so the magnetic fields and the particle motion in the inner magnetosphere are coupled to each other. And the whole system needs to find an equilibrium solution. And I'm going to come back to exactly what that equilibrium solution should be later in the talk. So on timescales where I can ignore the DEDT term in Maxwell's equations, divergence of J equals zero still has to apply. So if the gradient curvature drifts are such that the ring current around the planet is not divergence free, well, that excess current needs to divert along the field lines and go down into the ionosphere. So if I take the ring current, integrate along the field line, and then take the horizontal divergence of that, that's the total amount of parallel current that has to be diverting down into the ionosphere. Now some fraction zeta of that is going to close in the northern hemisphere, the remainder is going to close in the southern hemisphere. If I can assume equal potential field lines, I can add these two equations and get a single equation relating the, the potential along an equipotential field line uh, to the field line current and also the wind driven currents from both hemispheres and the conductances from both hemispheres. So this is a boundary value problem that describes the coupling between the mid-latitude ionosphere and the inner magnetosphere. So up until now, I've been talking a lot about individual particle motion and then getting to what are static boundary value problems for equilibrium states. But I haven't talked any about transient evolution. And it's much easier to talk about um, the transient evolution from an arbitrary initial value using fluid theories. So MHD is uh, a completely different language from what I've used thus far. Uh, but it is an extremely valuable theory to learn how to use. And the starting point are the two fluid equations. So you can arrive at these equations for the electrons and for the ions by taking the first three moments of the Vlasov equation and then closing the system by assuming that the particle distribution functions are approximately Maxwellian, such that I can get rid of the heat flow terms and some of the stress terms and so forth. So physically, these equations represent conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, and conservation of energy for the electrons, and the same for the ions. Now, you can work just with these two fluid equations as they are. But another way to do it is to define a new set of variables such that you treat the plasma as a single fluid. So I'm going to define a mass density of the whole plasma, a bulk drift velocity that is like a mass-weighted drift velocity, uh, the total pressure, and then current is defined in the normal way. I'm furthermore going to make a couple approximations. So I'm going to assume quasi-neutrality. So the, at any given point, the electron density is approximately equal to the ion density. And I'm furthermore going to assume that the electrons are much, much less massive than the ions. And that allows me to drop a bunch of small terms. Um, so the mass density is dominated by the ion density. The bulk velocity is dominated by the ion velocity. And the current can be written in terms of the difference between the bulk velocity and the electron velocity. And so if you take these definitions and these approximations, take the two fluid equations, rearrange them to a bunch of math, you can get to the set of equations that I am used to calling extended MHD. And other people have different names for this set of equations. Um, these equations physically represent conservation of mass in the whole plasma, conservation of momentum in the whole plasma, uh, there's an energy equation that I've written here in terms of entropy because it's shorter, but there's lots of different ways to write the energy equation. Um, these are the Maxwell's equations. And then the last and most complicated equation is the equation for the evolution of the current that comes from subtracting the uh, ion and electron momentum equations. That is referred to as the extended MHG generalized Ohm's law. So in deriving this, I didn't throw away any time derivative terms which means that this set of equations is completely appropriate for actually solving initial value problems. So if I have some arbitrary state, how does the plasma evolve away from that arbitrary state on all the different hierarchy of time scales? So I want to look much more closely at this generalized Ohm's law. There's a lot of terms in it, um, but a lot of them are small in a number of cases. So all the terms that are colored in orange here are associated with electron inertia. The electron mass is sitting out front here. And so as the electron mass goes to zero, 
these all become negligible. Uh, the typical rule of thumb is that these terms are negligible on length scales longer than what is called the electron inertial length. There is this term associated with the electron pressure gradient that is called the ambipolar electric field. In a cold plasma, that would be negligible. I'm going to come back to that term much later in the talk. There is the Hall term that is associated with the electrons and ions not moving together. Um, in a collisionless plasma, the typical rule of thumb is that this term is negligible on length scales larger than the so-called ion inertial length. Now, in a collisional plasma like the ionosphere, the Hall term should always be retained because collisions can cause the ions and electrons to move, in, move differently from each other um, just by themselves. And then lastly, there's a collisional term that is the resistive term, which would be zero in a collisionless plasma. So if you throw away all the terms that I have in colors here, all you're left with is E, e plus U cross B equals zero. And if that's all you retain, that's how you get down to ideal MHD. So ideal MHD, you say E cross U cross B equals zero, which is equivalent to saying that the bulk velocity is equal to the E cross B drift velocity. Furthermore, you throw away the time derivative term in the ampere maxwell law, so it's that you can replace the currents with one over mu naught times the curl of B. And with those two assumptions, you can eliminate the electric field and the currents from the system of equations, and you get a set of equations describing the fluid flows and the magnetic field evolution. So this is conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, conservation of entropy in this case, or energy. Uh, and then this is Faraday's law with minus U cross B substituted in for the electric field. So this describes the coupled evolution of the fluid parameters and the magnetic field, hence the name magnetohydrodynamics. So there's a number of important things to understand about MHC. The first thing I want to look at closely is this force term, the curl B cross B force. This is variously referred to as uh, the magnetic stress or the magnetic tension force or the magnetic pressure force. Um, it is a restoring force in the plasma that if you perturb the magnetic fields, it causes them to want to go back to some kind of equilibrium. So suppose that I had straight magnetic field lines that I then bent. Well, if you bend the magnetic fields, you'll induce a, you'll have a curl B. Curl B cross B will be such that it wants to unbend them. So magnetic field lines want to straighten themselves in some sense. This force, now if you bent them like this and they snapped back under the Kirby cross B force, well, because there is some mass to the plasma, it would overshoot that and it would oscillate around. So if you pluck a magnetic field line, it'll oscillate like a plucked guitar string. And this leads to what are called the shear alphane waves, which are the, the basic type of wave in uh, ideal MHD. There's also a compressional alphane wave. So if I have field lines and I push them closer together, even though the field lines are straight, there's still a non-zero curl. So if I were to put an imaginary pinwheel here, there's more flux on that side than that side, so there would be a curl into the board. The curl B cross B force points outwards, away from the region of high magnetic intensity. And so that's what we refer to as a magnetic pressure force. So there is a, the compressional alphane waves are they're sometimes called magnetosonic waves because they're very much like sound waves, but their restoring force is magnetic pressure, not fluid pressure. The other thing that's discussed a lot with ideal MHD is the so-called frozen in condition. So dBdt equals curl U cross B implies that if I take a tube of plasma that has some magnetic flux in it, and I follow that tube as it moves and maybe expands and distorts itself, the total amount of magnetic flux contained in that tube, in the frame moving with the tube, will be conserved. So if I had some tube and it expanded, then the magnetic field inside of it must change such that the flux inside is always conserved. Now there's two different interpretations of this frozen in condition. If I'm in an electrostatic field, then curl U cross B is always zero. In that case, the flux tubes will expand and contract just so that they always enclose the same amount of magnetic flux. And if you're in a place like the high latitude ionosphere where the magnetic field is not changing appreciably, then the tubes will stay the same size. And so the ionospheric flows are approximately incompressible. In inductive fields, curl U cross B is non-zero. And so the magnetic field is changing. And the magnetic field will always be changing in such a way 
that it will obey this frozen in condition. Now, the frozen in condition is a property of ideal MHD. It's not a law of nature. It can be violated, and it is violated in a process called magnetic reconnection. So if I have magnetic field lines uh, in an opposite sense, approaching a small region, these field lines can reconnect to each other uh, and introduce outflowing regions where the magnetic topology has changed. And this violates ideal MHD, but if you think about it, as you shrink down to smaller and smaller scales as you approach this X line, the approximations underlying MHD progressively break down. So once I get to scale size smaller than the ion inertial length, the Hall term starts to become important. That's the so-called ion diffusion region. And as I get further in, once I get to scale sizes smaller than the electron inertial length, the electron, uh, the electron inertial terms become important. There are also kinetic processes going on in this electron diffusion region. So I've written the pressure here not as a scalar pressure, but a kinetic pressure tensor. And exactly what is going on inside the electron diffusion region to enable reconnection in collisionless plasmas is still a very active area of research. It's the core mission of the MMS mission. Uh, it's one of the greatest unsolved problems in geospace electrodynamics. So MHD is conventionally used in the solar wind, the solar corona, the outer magnetosphere, but it can be used to understand a lot of the other theories that I already talked about. So, for example, the ring current can be thought about from the MHD point of view of force and stress balance. So if I take the MHD momentum equation and I throw away the ion inertial terms and take a steady state version of it, I can solve for what the currents must be such that the J cross B force balances all the other forces. And I get a term associated with pressure gradients and a term associated with gravity. So for hot plasmas in the inner magnetosphere, the pressure gradient term is the really important term. So if I have a bunch of hot plasma, the pressure gradient force po points outwards. Um, negative grad P cross B is associated with a current that is moving in the clockwise direction, the right direction for the ring current. And the J cross B force associated with that current points in the opposite direction and balances that pressure gradient outwards. So MHD is a poor approximation for the real dynamics of the ring current because using a single scalar pressure uh, to describe the energy distribution is a poor approximation to the real physics of gradient curvature drift. However, going through this derivation gives you an intuition for why the inner magnetosphere is capable of reaching a steady state in which there is a non-zero ring current. The steady state that the inner magnetosphere evolves towards is a state of stress balance, where the fluid stresses and the magnetic stresses are balancing each other. There is also a way to get all the way from MHD back down to the ionosphere dynamo equation. Um, and it involves more math than you would initially expect. So the first thing you have to do is you have to rederive the generalized Ohm's law with collisions with neutrals and neutral winds involved. So there are some extra neutral collision frequencies that appear in the resistive term, and there's also a neutral wind drag term. So if the electron and ion collision frequencies are not equal to each other, then the drag on the neutrals will drive a net current. Now, if you throw away the electron inertial terms, you get this equation, but this equation is not equivalent to the ionospheric Ohm's law. So if you go back to the way I derived the ionospheric Ohm's law the first time, I took the steady state momentum equations for all of the plasma species, not just the electrons. And so in order to get there from MHD, I also need to omit the inertial term, the ion inertial terms, which appear in the momentum equation. So I also need to write down the steady state MHD momentum equation, and again, I've added a neutral drag term to it. You can take this equation and solve it for the bulk velocity U. And so the bulk velocity U is equal to the neutral velocity plus a bunch of other terms. If the ion neutral collision frequency goes to infinity, the second term goes to zero, the neutrals and the ions move together. They're strongly coupled. For a finite neutral term, the, they won't move exactly together because there are other forces acting on the ions that aren't acting the same way on the neutrals. If I take this steady state expression for the plasma bulk velocity and substitute it in there and there in the generalized Ohm's law, 
I get a very long expression. But if you look at that expression, you notice a couple things. First off, the electric field and the neutral winds only appear once each, and they appear together as the quantity E plus UN cross B. All these other terms are related to the current, gravity, and uh, pressure gradient. And so if I go through a lot of tensor algebra to flip this equation around and solve it for J, I get J is a conductivity tensor times the quantity E plus UN cross B plus a term associated with pressure gradients and a term associated with gravity. This is exactly the ionospheric Ohm's law that I wrote before. Now in order to get here, I had to throw away a lot of time derivative terms on my way, which means that this ionospheric Ohm's law is not valid for describing transient behavior in the ionosphere. MHD is really the right way to describe short-term transients in the ionosphere. Um, so this is some work that was done recently by my friend Eugene Dow for his PhD dissertation doing fully electromagnetic simulations of the low latitude ionosphere, where he initializes the equatorial ionosphere with, with some plasma depletion, and then watches that depletion polarize and launch alphane waves that then bounce around the ionosphere. And if you look closely at this plot, you can actually see the waves bouncing up and down. And it takes about 10 to 20 seconds for all those bouncing alphane waves to settle down to something that looks like the ionospheric limit. So the next topic I want to move on to is solar wind, magnetosphere, ionosphere coupling. So to put together the whole coupled picture, you need to combine a lot of things that I've already talked about. So in the case where the solar wind is carrying a magnetic field that is pointed southwards, when that arrives at the front of the planet, it's pointed the opposite direction from the Earth's magnetic fields on the day side. And so reconnection can happen here on the day side these newly opened flux tubes will convect across the polar cap and then build up in the night side. You'll get a build up in the night side of fields that are pointed in the opposite direction. And so reconnection will happen again in the night side, introducing uh, fast flows outwards down the tail and also fast flows inwards towards the inner magnetosphere. And the last step that's missing from this picture is the flows of those inward things around the sides of the planet back towards the day side. So this cartoon of convection that's been around since 1961 is what we call the, the Dungy cycle. If you look down in the ionosphere, what's going on in the ionosphere while this Dungy cycle is going on? Well, here are typical plots of high-latitude ionosphere convection. So in the case where BZ is south, what I've plotted here is the ionospheric potential. But if you think about, okay, the electric field is perpendicular to contours of constant potential, and then take the E cross B drift, you realize that contours of constant potential are also streamlines of the E cross B drift. So down in the ionosphere, you have foot points of the field lines that are hooked to things that are going, undergoing reconnection on the day side. The open flux tubes are dragged across the polar cap, and the base of those flux tubes are dragged along with them across the polar cap from the day side to night side. There's reconnection again that occurs on the night side, and then there's return flows around the side of the planet. And so the base of the flux tubes in the ionosphere trace out the whole Dungy cycle, just being dragged along. Now, in the BZ northward case, reconnection is going to happen up here in the lobes instead of on the day side. And so that's going to draw, drive a strong sunwards convection on the day side. And then there's larger, weaker cells everywhere that are not driven by reconnection, just driven by viscous interactions between the solar wind. So the explanation that I just gave of high latitude convection was a very mechanical way of thinking about it. The flux tubes are moving around in the magnetosphere and they're, dry, they're dragging the bases through the ionosphere as they do it. You could also equivalently think of this whole process from an electrical point of view. So whatever the dynamics of the magnetosphere are doing, they are producing currents. And if the perpendicular currents in the magnetosphere uh, have, are divergent, then they must be diverting into field line currents that have to close in the ionosphere. Um, so I've already introduced the region two field line current. If you have a piece of the ring current that is not closed, then it diverts into the ionosphere. There's also a region one field line current system, which is coming from much further out in the magnetosphere. And there's lots of different ways to understand exactly where these currents come from. So any time that you have a divergence of perpendicular current, if you integrate that along the field line, you'll get the total amount of parallel current that must be diverting into the ionosphere. 
So if, for example, the perpendicular current were primarily determined by a diamagnetic current, force balancing the pressure gradients, if you substitute that into this expression, if you furthermore assume that the pressure distribution along the field lines um, is in equilibrium, such that the pressure in the equatorial plane completely determines the pressure everywhere else, you can rearrange this equation into something that depends on the cross product between the pressure gradients and the gradients in flux tube volume, where flux tube volume is defined in terms of the magnetic field strength. So here's a cartoon for a, a particular configuration of magnetospheric pressure and a configuration of flux tube volume that would drive region one type currents that go inwards from the opposite sense of the region two and outwards from the other. This is just for diamagnetic currents. Um, if you put in you know, transients associated with ion inertia or gravity, pretty much anything that drives a divergent current in the magnetosphere will have to divert into the ionosphere at some point. The electric fields that are driven by those currents closing in the ionosphere are exactly equal to these convection electric fields I showed you before. The electrical way of thinking about it and the mechanical way of thinking about it will give you the exact same answer um, in the steady state. It doesn't matter if you think about the magnetosphere as communicating with the ionosphere via currents or via magnetic stresses, they are equivalent. All of this uh, transport into the, all this coupling into the ionosphere uh, is transporting a lot of energy down into the ionosphere. So electromagnetic energy is typically discussed in terms of pointing the pointing's theorem. So this is an expression of conservation of energy uh, in electrodynamic fields that you can derive directly from Maxwell's equations. So this is the energy density. Um, this is the pointing vector, which is um, essentially energy flux carried by electromagnetic waves. Um, and J dot E is what is referred to as joule heating. Now a much harder exercise is deriving a conservation of energy equation for the entire coupled plasma neutral system. But you can do it. And if you look at the energy dissipation term in there, it looks like a joule heating term, a J dot E term, but using the electric field in the neutral wind frame. So what ionospheric physicists typically call joule heating is not actually J dot E, but J dot E prime, where E prime is E plus UN cross B. And if you go back to the definition of the Pedersen conductivity and rearrange this equation, and assume that the ion velocity is the E cross B drift, you can rearrange this into what looks like a frictional heating term. It's proportional to the magnitude squared of the velocity difference between the ions and the neutrons. So here again, we get both an electrical and a mechanical way of thinking about it. You can either think about it from a joule heating, or you can think about it from a frictional heating point of view, and you get the same answer. So these different ways of thinking break down as you go to shorter and shorter time scales. So the magnetosphere ionosphere system is virtually never in just a simple steady state. There are all kinds of transient behaviors going on all over the magnetosphere. How are those transients communicated down into the ionosphere? Through Alfane waves, right? And the, the simple model of that coupling is to just model the field lines as if they were transmission lines for Alfane waves. So if I'm in an electrostatic case where I have current coming down, closing through the ionosphere and coming up, there's an electric field across that current closing layer, and there's a perturbation magnetic field associated with these horizontal currents. And that perturbation magnetic field, if you just use you know, Ampere's law for a simple sheet current, um, is such that E over delta B times mu naught is one over the Pedersen conductance. Um, if I had an Alfane wave, however, as an Alfane wave is propagating down, it has both an electric field and a perturbation magnetic field. Uh, but the ratio of them is determined by the Alfane speed. And I can define an effective Alfane conductance such that it is one over mu naught times V Alfane. And the Alfane conductance is normally much less than the Pedersen conductance in the ionosphere. And so there's a mismatch. And so there has to be a reflected Alfane wave that forms such that the sum of the electric fields divided by uh, the difference in the magnetic fields, uh, there should be a mu naught there, uh, is one over sigma P. And from that, you can derive what the reflection coefficient must be. And if you look at this expression for the reflection coefficient, particularly the electrical engineers in the audience will notice that this looks exactly like transmission line equations, right? So this simple transmission line model, it's used a lot, but it's based on a number of assumptions. It's assuming the ionosphere is a, a thin slab, and it's assuming that the alphane speed above the ionosphere is simply a constant. 
The general case, there are gradients in the alphane speed, and the ionosphere has some non-trivial thickness to it. Uh, and exactly how the so-called inductive ionosphere magnetosphere coupling should work and how the propagation of all those alphane waves should really work in the, in the more general case is still an ongoing area of research. So the ionosphere is not just a passive load. The fact that all these alphane waves are reflecting off the ionosphere back into the magnetosphere then forces the magnetosphere to rearrange itself. Um, so this is a very interesting simulation example done by Lotko et al. of just how important ionospheric conductance can be. So they ran an LFM simulation with just a constant ionospheric conductance, and they got a symmetric distribution in the magnetosphere. They then did it with a realistic conductance distribution that was large on the day side and had a ring of large Hall conductivity associated with the auroral oval. And in that case, the magnetosphere skews itself such that there's more fast flows on the dusk side than on the dawn side. And then they did a, an unrealistic case just to see what would happen, where instead of putting a, an enhancement in the Hall conductivity, they put a depletion in the Hall conductivity. And that generates a skew, but in the opposite sense. So this is you know, a simulation demonstration that the inner boundary conditions on a magnetosphere simulation actually strongly influence the whole state that will result. And thus the ionospheric conductivity is actually crucially important to understanding magnetospheric dynamics. So most magnetosphere ionosphere models um, have a gap between the magnetosphere portion of the model and the ionosphere portion of the model. And when you hear people talk about the magnetosphere ionosphere gap region, I kind of cringe every time I hear this term because there's no gap in geospace. This gap is a, a model of it's an artifact of the state of the art of modeling right now. It's not a real thing, right? So typical MHD models of the magnetosphere will only go into two or three RE. And they don't try to go all the way into the planet uh, because the alphane speeds get really fast as you come in towards the planet and the magnetic fields get really strong. And so in order to go all the way in, you would need to use incredibly small time steps and it's not very practical. Ionosphere thermosphere models, they typically only operate up to 600 kilometers or so. And so there's this big gap between, this is drawn to scale, um, between the top of an ionosphere thermosphere model and the inner boundary of a magnetosphere model. And what most of the models do is they just assume from the inner boundary of the magnetosphere model down to the ionosphere, the fields map electrostatically along equal potential field lines. The ionosphere is treated like a slab as far as the magnetosphere is concerned, and so it just provides the termination of these transmission lines. But that gap misses just how rich the physics really is in this region, right? There's not just electrodynamic coupling happening in there, both electrostatic and inductive, but there's also flow of particles and energy and momentum through there. So this region of space has a bunch of paraelectric fields in it. So I mentioned the ambipolar term before, right? And the ambipolar term forces the electrons and the ions to move together. So if you have the electrons running away from the ions, well, uh, an electric field would develop, and the electric field develops such that the ions are dragged along with the electrons. <laughs> so in this example, the electrons are the excited little dog, the poor guy being dragged along is, is the ions, and the leash holding them together is this ambipolar electric field. If you look at the Ohm's law, notice that U cross B and J cross B are always perpendicular to B, but the ambipolar term can have a component that's non-zero parallel to B. Uh, and so even though this is normally small, the fact that it's parallel to B can lead to important behavior. One of those important behaviors is the classical polar wind. So if I have a plasma composed of mostly heavy oxygen ions, uh, the equilibrium state will be such that the upwards and polar electric fields balance gravity. If I introduce a small amount of light ions, H plus, into this picture, well, those, it won't disturb the equilibrium electric fields much, but those H plus will experience the same electric field, but much less gravity, and thus be shot out. And so in the middle latitudes, all these outflowing light ions fill a region called the plasmosphere on closed field lines. But at high latitudes on the open field lines, these light ions just escape in what we call the classical polar wind. There are more types of paraelectric fields in geospace than just the ambipolar field. Um, so in the day side polar cap, there's this issue of how do the field lines achieve zero current given that there are so many ionospheric photoelectrons. So if you compute the flux of ionospheric photoelectrons that are being created on the day side and escaping, 
uh, it is much larger than the classical polar wind outflow. And so in order for the field line to achieve zero current, there has to be a parallelic field that forms such that a lot of these escape, what would otherwise be escaping photoelectrons, will be reflected back in. And there's experimental proof that this happens. Here's a, a plot from FAST that was made by Naritoshi Kitamura showing here's the upwards going photoelectron distribution and here is a reflected copy of it coming back down up to some particular energy. So this proves that there is a, a potential drop of around 30 volts above the spacecraft in this example. I just talked about zero current, but there's also the issue of how do field lines carry upward current? So there's certain times where the magnetosphere ionosphere coupling requires field lines to carry a ton of upwards field line current, which means there's got to be a lot of electrons coming down into the ionosphere. But how do those electrons get from the magnetosphere down into the ionosphere, given that there's a magnetic mirror force pushing them back out? Well, if there's not enough of them that are close enough in the loss cone to carry the re required current, a parallelectric field will form in order to drive those, uh, those currents. And that, those parallelectric fields are, they can be in excess of a kilovolt easily, uh, and they drive uh, what we call the monoenergetic aurora, which is actually responsible for a lot of the really just pretty discrete aurora pictures you see all the time. In order to find this term in the Ohm's law, you can't actually find it in the Ohm's law that I've been presenting because I was using a scalar pressure. You have to introduce anisotropy in order to find this mirror force term. But if you do, you do indeed find that the quote unquote ambipolar term has an extra term associated with the mirror force in it. The Polar wind region is not only where electrons are being accelerated down, but ions are being accelerated out. And so I talked about the classical polar wind, but that only explains the acceleration of the light ions, H and HE. But in the magnetosphere, it's routine to, research, to observe O plus. And there are even observations of N2 plus, NO plus, O2 plus, very heavy ions. And so an open question is how do all these ions escape gravity? The parallelectric fields certainly make it easier, but they typically form at very high altitudes that are kind of hard to explain all the outflow that we actually see. Uh, and so the other mechanism that's talked about a lot is transverse acceleration combined with the mirror force. So here's an example of a so-called ion conic distribution. Um, so this is a plot of the parallel velocity versus the perpendicular velocity. And what's happened here is uh, transverse acceleration has created kind of a toroidal distribution that has then been folded upwards on itself by the mag magnetic mirror force. So ion alpha is still very much an area of research, but kind of the emerging picture of it as, as a multi-step process, not something that's driven by just one mechanism. So there's lots of type of energy coming into the ionosphere from the magnetosphere. There's electromagnetic energy, uh, which results in joule dissipation, ion heating, and upflow. There's also precipitation that results in electron heating, increased ambipolar electric field, and upflow. And then these upflows have to be accelerated all the way to escape energies by something going on at higher altitudes, presumably some kind of wave-particle interactions. And exactly what are the most important types of waves is still an outstanding question. So this is my last slide. There are a lot of open research questions in our field. There's still a lot to do. There's more than I could possibly list on a final slide. But if you look around the research questions that are open and you ask, why is this still an unsolved problem? Why is this still difficult? You notice that a lot of these problems involve interactions across scales, across time scales, across energies, across regions, such that no one of the theories that I've talked about so far adequately explains all of them, right? So if you have a situation where the assumptions underlying the approximate theories that you're trying to use are violated, then you have trouble describing what should happen. And you look around the, the open questions, that's a common feature of a lot of them. So collisionless reconnection is one of the ultimate scale, ultimate examples of cross-scale couplings. Um, complicated physics that's happening down in ion inertial scale, electron inertial scales, is enabling something that changes the topology all the way on the global scale. Uh, I talked about inductive coupling, how do alpha and propagation down in the ionosphere actually work. Um, related to that is the issue of conjugacy. So the, at low latitudes in the ionosphere, the assumptions that electric fields map and that the two hemispheres are conjugate to each other is routinely used. In the high latitudes, the two high latitudes are routinely solved separately. 
there should be some gradual transition as you go from low latitudes to high latitudes where the assumption of magnetic conductivity breaks down. And exactly how that transition works is still not understood. Um, tail intermagnetosphere interactions are very interesting. So there are fast flows coming in from the tail into the intermagnetosphere that are so fast that you have to retain all the inertial terms and the time derivative terms to describe them well. But they also get so energetic that gradient curvature drift is important. So the standard ring current theory that I talked about doesn't deal with the fast time scales. And MHD doesn't deal with the energy dependence of the gradient curvature drift. And so how do you properly describe tail intermagnetosphere interactions? I talked about particle acceleration, how are electrons being accelerated down in the aurora, how are ions being accelerating out. Uh, a problem I really like that I didn't have time to talk about is, okay, when all these heavy ions get out and they land in the magnetotail, how do they change magnetotail dynamics? The MHD theory that I went through today was single fluid MHD, where there's one species of electrons, one species of ions. But in order to describe all these interactions between outflow and magnetotail dynamics, we need to develop multi-fluid MHD theories, and multi-fluid MHD modeling of the magnetosphere is a very active area of research right now. So there's still a lot to do in this field. Electrodynamics is not a solved problem. Thank you very much.